hello everyone welcome welcome to the eo cafe um for those for anyone who hasn't joined us before uh just a little explanation the eo cafe is a informal um, location virtual location of course virtual cafe where we try to meet very informally every two weeks um, discuss issues topics which are of interest to the EO community and just give everyone a chance to uh, to meet each other and to uh, to stay in contact um, during the EO cafe I talk with uh, our guests um, everyone's invited to listen to our conversation and uh, later on you can join in and ask questions and uh, just join in the discussion it's all very very informal uh, just to a uh, reminder of the rules oh, they're on the screen there so please uh, keep your microphones off unless you're invited to speak um, you're very welcome to keep cameras on we encourage it because that makes it more uh, more friendly more informal um, if you have questions please uh, do ask them ask them through the chat put them into the chat and then at the appropriate time I'll call you to ask your question at which point you should open your microphone and uh, and and join the conversation so uh, I'm pleased to say this week we have uh, Steve Ramage Steve is uh, well known in the community um, even if only for his very active Twitter account um, <laughs> St Steve, Steve is in charge of external relations in the Geo Secretariat in Geneva. Um, he's been there for three years now and uh, I think will now plans to stay for another two years. Uh, before that, he had prominent roles in the um, public sector and in the private sector. Steve was the owner, um, director of a geospatial startup, One Spatial and has held a number of prominent leadership positions in other organizations like uh, Ordnance Survey and uh, OGC, the Open Geospatial Consortium. So Steve has a very special mix of experience between public and private sectors. And that's why I was particularly interested to invite him to come along today to have a chat around uh, the subject. So welcome, Steve. Um, we asked Steve today following the recent Geo Week, which this year was a virtual meeting, as, as most of the meetings are, um, and to have a talk around how the industry is evolving and how industry can get more out of Geo. Now, um, we'll talk about Geo, we'll talk about what it can do, and we'll talk about the industry. So, but before we start, I think. Steve, you have a, a, a please um, uh, explain a little bit about your background, about your uh, your interests, and you have a few slides, I think, to explain the the Geo Week. So let me uh, give the floor to you to uh, to start with. So I never thought that I'd come away from this session knowing that my headstone was going to say Stephen was on Twitter. <laughs> no, nothing else. <laughs> How could we miss you on Twitter? <laughs> So, well, it's nice to see some familiar faces here as I scan the, uh, the videos. Um, yeah, so I, I've been in, uh, I guess, geospatial or location since uh, the early 90s when I, I kind of accidentally fell into a company doing marine survey and offshore positioning, precise positioning. So the early days, uh, I always remember we had a, a differential GPS corrections receiver and the, the, the kind of the marketing spiel was the world's smallest Inmarsat DGPS corrections receiver. <laughs> you know, it wouldn't even fit on any of the paper or any of the, the marketing stuff we did. Right, big um, business cards. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I, I spent, that was kind of get, so that was the early days of getting into to GPS and Someone saw my CV and they saw a GPS on it in the late 90s. And at that time, Navtech, um, which some of you might remember, which is now called HERE, um, they were looking for someone to help set up their wireless and internet business. And so I, I went through the pain of working with WAP phones and trying to get like a, a, a real-time online navigation service that would take about 20 minutes to get connected. I mean, can you imagine it today trying to sit there? I mean, I have a 16 year old son, you spend about 30 seconds and then he'd be like, nope, next thing, next thing. Mm -hmm. um, 
And so I spent some time here and then we were selling data, navigable road databases to a company in Cambridge called One Spatial. And so uh, I went to work for One Spatial. I went over as a product manager working on a server side topology engine which was taking a, an object-oriented database. I was way more technical in those days, taking an object-oriented database and porting the DLLs, the, the, the libraries, into an Oracle 9 environment. And this was going to save the world. And this was really my the first time I, I understood how much um, in new businesses you over-inflate sales and the prospects and the size of the market versus... Mm -hmm the reality of how many people and how much money it costs you to deliver. Um, as a product manager, that was a huge learning experience for me. And I stayed there for uh, almost 10 years and uh, bought the company with a couple of others. We did a management buyout. And I think that they're doing pretty well now. I think they're about 250 people still going in Cambridge. Um, some nice business out of the States. Um, they bought um, a French company, and, and when I was there, we bought a small Norwegian company, Sisteco, and we bought Proteus in Ireland. So they've kind of grown by a bit organically and a bit by acquisition. And then I spent a couple of years, maybe three years at OGC, doing open standards work. Um, and then uh, our friend Vanessa Lawrence, who was on the board of OGC, invited me to apply to be the uh, MD of Ordnance Surveys International Business. So I then set that up which was another kind of two or three years. Um, and then I, I went into, I, I took a period of time off doing some advisory stuff for the World Bank and the UN. And kind of like, I think at that point, I, I sort of, I moved into looking at less being embedded in technology and trying to look more at how science and technology could help kind of policy and business and mostly decision makings. So sort of, I wrote a short paper for the Association of Geographic Information in the UK on the technology translation gap. And that's really what I've spent the last decade doing. Mm -hmm. So after I left uh, OS and after I did the consulting, I sat on the board of a startup in London called What Three Words, that's right. which people either love or hate. <laughs> All the people who like coordinate reference systems and surveying and getting deep down and dirty with coordinates, they hate it. Um, so all the traditional surveyors I work with and then all the people who don't have a clue about geography and who just want a location and understand the sort of simplicity of it, they love it. So I don't understand the business model behind it, but they're growing and they're worth a lot of money. Um, and then uh, I joined uh, Geo almost, uh, I mean, this is me in my fifth year now. And so like you say, I've been a bit of being in the private sector for kind of 15 years and then a bit of being in the public sector for kind of 10 years. So it's a kind of a crossover uh, a crossover role. But I never really want to stay anywhere more than five years because I feel I get stale and I want to learn and I want to... So having stayed at one space for almost 10 years, that <laughs> that was quite <laughs> difficult. So now I'm like, you know, got another couple of years at GEO and then I'll see, see what's next. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And... Um... The the industry our industry is growing um, steadily. I mean, our uh, we 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 do our survey every year, so I think we we we're pretty um, positive about the shape of the industry. But one of the things I wanted to talk about with you was, uh, you know, how how we see the industry changing. Um, you know, there's a lot of things going on, a lot of new. Uh, technologies coming in a lot of new markets a lot of new companies um, in our industry survey we see the number of companies and I've got a particular uh, issue to deal with this year because I see m many more companies coming from outside the sector and starting to pick up and use earth observation services so they're not, they're not earth observation services companies but they're very definitely using earth observation yeah. services. So we have to uh, account for those in our, in our survey uh, uh, this year. How do you, what's your, your perspective on how the sector is evolving? What do you think are the challenges uh, um, to the sector? So I, I find, um, I mean, I'm not that old, but I find that I, I get people coming to me and trying to explain interoperability to me. 
mm. and stuff that I worked on a decade ago and they're like all excited about it. And I find <laughs> it's kind of, I have to be very patient and, and I find a lot of people I work with a lot. I mean, I see people like Jeff Smith and a few others on the line here. We've all had these discussions a long time ago and I find that it, it, it's, it's almost like, you know, cause you, you have seen it. I mean, you're, you're older than me. Um, as you That's go true. through, well, you, you know, you've got less hair for sure. Um, as you go through, um, there are these cycles that come and it feels like we're in a second wave of everyone getting interested in data access and data mm. sharing and interoperability. And, you know, it's moving forward. You've got things like the, the cloud optimized geotiff and the, the spatial temporal asset catalog. You've got all that industry work going on, but it feels like it's a second cycle of a lot of this. And, and maybe it's streamlining and maybe it's improving some of the stuff we tried a decade ago, but it does feel like we're repeating. I see it a lot in the SDG community that I work with. Mm -hmm. I see them talking a lot and I hear people saying to me, you know, they're, they're amazed that they can put um, a location on a project, you know, where they're doing a project and some stuff that's really quite basic compared to when I speak to the, the people who've been in the industry a long time and the, a lot of the startups that are working on AI and ML and some of these things which are light years ahead of where some of the activities are in the um, maybe the, the, the larger um, kind of public sector activities. So one, one of the things, uh, yesterday I started a course at the uh, University of Cambridge on sustainable finance. <coughs> and there's about, I think there's about 50 of us on the course and I'm probably the only non-finance person there are so many people who are like from HSBC or, or even insurance. There's a lot of people in there from insurance and they're all talking about stuff that we do day in, day out and things where we know earth observations have a massive impact and it's very, very new to them. Um, and they're using obviously a different lexicon, a different taxonomy, a different set of, you know, a different language to us. And so I think for me, it's how do we, how do we bring along these new entrants, not discourage them, but let them know this is not new. We've been doing a lot of this stuff mm -hmm. and show them what's available and what's accessible and what they can use. And maybe more importantly, who the experts are or who the practitioners are who are all on this call right now, or I'm guessing a number of them are. Mm. I mean, one of the, you, you talk about 10 years ago, I mean, the thing that uh, really strikes me from 10 years ago, obviously the technology has changed, but it's, it's, it's the number of data sources. You know, we used to be dealing with data coming from, from Landsat or uh, uh, MVSat or, uh, you know, there was the Rapid Eye constellation, there were different satellites, but they were essentially one-offs. Now there are so many different data sources that uh, you can you can rely on the data. This is not a new theme. So uh, you know, for me, that's one of the the key factors that's driving the uh, uh, the sector. Data is becoming a bit of a of a commodity. But I, I guess the question is, how is that's going to play out over the next five years? That's what we we tried to uh, to think about. You know, what are the what are the trends? What's what's going what what are the companies going to um, come up against you know in terms of uh, challenges um, we see new entrants coming into the into the business we knew we see uh, new technology what would you say are the three three biggest challenges uh, you didn't tell me that in the briefing ah, uh, it was there was it all right <laughs> um, I, I think, um, th th there's some pretty fundamental stuff um, maybe not so much in Europe, but definitely for other parts of the world, which is around connectivity. Mm -hmm. So just having basic access to services. And I think, you know, it is such a global industry now that we need to think about what that means. Mm -hmm. um, one of the other things that comes up a lot in the work that we do is sovereignty, data sovereignty. Yeah. So people get really concerned about using the cloud, about where the data is going to be stored, you know, the, the privacy elements of it, or even who's going to access it, who's going to own it. So, so that would probably be the second one. And maybe the third one for me is, um, I, I kind of like to move from data to domains. Um, I, I've, you know, having worked at Ordnance Survey, which is data, 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 um, and, and I work very closely with all the national mapping agencies for a long time, and the cadastral agencies, and now with the space agencies, 
I still think there's this fixation on data and I think we have mm -hmm. a lot of the data. And so I'd really like to move much more into the domains. And I think that makes it easier for not just the new entrants, it makes it easier for everyone. Um, I mean, yes, we still have to talk about how to access the data, how to download the data, where to store and process the data. But, you know, I mean, that, that was kind of the, that was kind of the reason we did, um, you know, we had this program we've been running for about a year and a half now with Amazon Web Services, with Google Earth Engine and with Microsoft AI for Earth, where we started with a million and a half from Amazon Web Services and we got the first 18 projects um, running in developing countries. And then uh, Google came along and kind of offered us, you know, double that. I mean, it's, it's probably closer to about five or six million now with the help we've got from them. And there's a company in Australia called EO Data Science who are running about 30 projects doing machine learning training, doing EO training, doing GIS and geospatial training. So they're doing a whole host of different types of training for the people in that program. Um, and then Microsoft AI for Earth gave us a million and, and half a million of that was cash. And I'm hoping to get another, I hope they're watching, I'm hoping to get another four or five million out of Microsoft to run again another open call for um, organizations to come in and do stuff on those platforms. So I think the work on the platforms is quite well understood now. And, you know, in Europe, you've got the DIAS, you've got numerous DIAS, you've got um, the open science cloud, you've got a lot of stuff already happening. So I think I'd, I'd really like to see a lot more focus on, on the domains. And, I, you know, I talked about the sustainable finance thing. I see there's something called spatial finance, where they're trying to embed geospatial technologies into the finance domain. And I think you've probably seen this already in insurance. And so that's kind of part of why I wanted to do the course was to get their perspective and to understand their challenges and their requirements and their language. And so I think that if we move more to the domains, that that will happen. I mean, you know, we're working in uh, agriculture, biodiversity, climate, disasters, energy, forestry, land. You know, those are just the things off the top of my head. And so each of those domains are very specific and they have a, a, a set of specific problems that, I mean, geospatially, they all have X and Y and, you know, time or whatever. But um, I think getting to the domain specific issues is what will take us forward because that's where the solutions lie and where we can develop, you know, more cr creativity. And, and then that, I don't know the word, I don't know if it's interdisciplinary or multidisciplinary, but bringing together, you know, if something, if, if something happens with water, water's very linked to soil, soil's very linked to agriculture, agriculture's very linked to food security, food security is linked to safety and security, safety and security is linked to citizens and, and well-being and health and, you know, all these things. So there's that all of that connectivity for me comes through the domains. Data underpins it, but they don't need to know about the data. They just want to use the data. Yeah, yeah, no, that's uh, that's a great way of, uh, of of looking at it. I mean, I thought you were um, describing um, our, our fire project for a moment there, but uh, I think uh, there's 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 some similarities. But let's not go down that. Uh, that, that that line but um you know for for a long time you could say it's been a technology looking for a solution but uh, i think now we're starting to see you see a market um we're starting to see different applications coming out in in different uh, domains or sectors and um you know i think the the potential in many of them is is absolutely huge so i think it's really uh, a good time a great time to be in the industry um how it will shape up in the next five years uh, will be really, really interesting to watch. But I do believe that where companies that are in this sector now are going to um, have an exciting, uh, exciting ride. Well, Jeff, uh, I mean, I, I, I just got invited to apply for a, there's a company, it's like more than, it's like six or $700 million company. Mm -hmm. And their geospatial division is about 50 million. And they're looking for a CEO to run that division. And, um, and in case my new boss is watching, I didn't, I didn't go for it, but it, it was interesting for me because they're big in energy and utilities and medical and a few other areas. And they see geospatial as the next 
area to take them forward. They see it as kind of the huge growth area and they see it as almost underpinning all the other areas. Yeah. So this kind yeah. of pervasive, you know, location uh, notion. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So location first and what's there second. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, let's, 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 let's come to geo because time's, time's running on. Um, so we've, We've had quite a lot of uh, interaction with Geo, with yourself, with uh, um, other people in the in the Geo Secretariat over the over the years. I think Geo is still something quite hard for companies to understand, and um, increasingly, I'm seeing experience that people from the other side having ha have it find it hard to understand the industry. Um, what can industry do to get more out of of, of Geo? I think it's, um, I mean, I, I've, I've been trying to figure this out for four years now. Yeah, yeah I know we've talked about it a lot. <laughs> yeah. um, I, I think what has happened and what is really encouraging is um, we, we've made incremental steps. So for many countries, it's not clear what the private sector brings apart from asking them for money. Or in certain cases, what even what the private sector is. Or what the private sector is, exactly, exactly. And I think I've seen a, a change in geo because of the work of a number of countries. Um, you know, like I, I would call out Canada, the UK, South Africa, Australia, um, and, and the work of Erskine and others in, in geo to kind of help with that education. And um, we, we've now got a, a, a kind of a group that's working on doing things like, you know, developing a perspective for SME engagement in geo, um, including industry associations and the regional geos. And for me, the first point of contact always with geo is a work program. Mm. You know, there are 70 activities, seven zero, and some of these are enormous. I mean, GFOI has had billions put into it. Um, we have emerging things like geo LDN, looking at land, de land degradation neutrality, and they've just come out to the to you know with a call for a technology innovation for six figures um, that's gone out has been an open call. Um, this morning I had a call with Digital Earth Africa, you know, which is producing open data for the whole continent based on Copernicus and Landsat, um, and also looking at ALOS and, and CompSat and other data sets. Um, and you know, I'm I'm quite soon I'm going to put out a call for. Um, we're, we're, going to, we're going to write a report on uh, the value of analysis-ready data on ARD, and that will go out to the private sector. So I think encouraging more of the work program to do this and to use GEO as the, the kind of the vehicle or the network to, to, to make more of these calls that they're going to do anyway, I think is very useful because it, if it becomes more structured, people have a a single place to go and find this information. I think a lot of the time that's the hard part is where do you go to find the opportunities? Mm -hmm. And at the same time, I think the private sector coming into GEO, um, we're looking at, you know, how do we connect SMEs or SMMEs because we look at micro size enterprises as well into like the, the GEO industry week. So we had the first one in Australia, which I thought was fantastic. I attended a number of events. It was very useful, lots of networking. And, and I know people got business out of that. Um, I, I don't think I'm telling if I say um, PCI Geomatics, who are now Catalyst.Earth, um, you know, they, they got some business out of doing that. They're now building some ARD components for South African Space Agency, and they're doing some other stuff as a result of their engagement there. Um, so I think connecting those SMMEs into the work program and then working with the work program activities themselves to kind of structure efforts around opportunities I think these are some of the things that we want to do. We want to actively work with, you know, if someone's looking at the ocean for Blue Planet, it's huge. And, and, and there's no way that all of the, the countries and the organizations, the, the, the public sector um, activities can manage all of this. So who's going to bring in um, those data products or those insights or, or you know, the, maybe not platforms, but different ways of connecting and, and getting the data out to the stakeholders. Um, that's all got to be something that, you know, th th they're going to do with the private sector anyway. So if we can 
kind of invite the private sector to share examples of what they're doing. And, and I'll go back to the domains in the different domains. You know, for the last industry track, we had DHI from Denmark through Ersk, who talked about water. We had others talking about, you know, agriculture, others talking about forestry. And forestry was interesting because we actually brought a timber company from Belize to talk about that. So it's it's not just this, it's not just the software or the data companies, it's others further down the supply chain. Mm -hmm. So that's a few different ideas, but this is what we're looking at as as a collective, you know, with the, the different countries coming together and sitting around and trying to think of things that we can concretely do. Yeah. I mean it's um the, the question then is how do the companies get get engaged with that i mean i think there are two or three things we've we, we've seen and i'm happy that there are some companies which are now investing some of their time to take part in some of the working groups which is which is, which is good i mean it's a marketing exercise for the companies it's yeah. part of networking it's not direct business but the expectation is it will help open up some doors in the future um, the second one, of course, is uh, is eShape. Um, we're going to come on to the regional uh, geos, but eShape is part of uh, EuroGeo um, and uh, is a project where there's a lot of um, academic and um, public uh, uh, institutions involved, but there's also quite a few uh, companies involved as well. And uh, I'm very optimistic that that will turn into services and commercial services that can be uh, um, picked up by um, representatives of uh, uh, part of GEO, part of the GEO membership. The third, of course, is the GEO membership, where you have, uh, keep saying it, 110 um, different countries as, as members. And the industry track, which was started in Australia, as you've mentioned just now, for me was a, a really, really successful way to bring industry and geo members into contact to, to exchange. Um, I think uh, it was a great shame that we weren't able to con really continue that exercise in, uh, in Port Elizabeth this year. Um, we had the, the virtual um, industry track with the Geo Week. You've referred to it with some companies uh, presenting, which was, was great. But as you know, the opportunity with these things is to, uh, you know, it's the meetings in the corridor, it's the shaking hands and the, yeah. uh, the meet and greet. And uh, Australia really built the, uh, the base for that, I felt. We worked very closely with um, um, Frontiers SI to, uh, and the Australian Space Agency at the time. And uh, you know, we'd hoped to have been planning to do the same thing in South Africa this year. So we'll continue to, uh, to try to support in, in that way. So I think um, I would say the industry track is really something that we, we feel is, uh, is, is very successful. Um, what, do you, what do you see coming from that? How do you see that industry track evolving? Uh, we talked about um, understanding each other. Can, can we do more to help that process as part of uh, Geo Week and industry track? Yeah, I mean, just thinking out loud, as you, as you were talking there, I was thinking, you know, there's, there's 112 countries now in Geo, but the countries, I, I mean, some countries have 15 national government agencies. You know, China has 19 or 20 that, that participate in the, the UK, are probably 10 or so. You know, USA is probably 10. So if you take 112 and let's say multiply even by six or seven, you know, you very quickly reach a large number of national government agencies and they all have individual budgets. They all have individual programs. They all, you know, I'm wondering if there's not a way to, I'm probably giving myself a huge amount of work here, but I'm wondering if there's not a way to, and maybe this goes back to the domains discussion. Maybe we need to think much more about the domains and have more tracks that are really driving down into the issues in agriculture, really driving down into water. Yeah. But I think for me, if I, if I was in a company right now, geo is still a bit of a long game. You know, I wouldn't come to geo. I would come to pick up business cards. I'd come to get insights um, on what the countries are thinking and where some of the investments are being made. That's quite obvious. You can see that. Um, and probably to get, like you say, to get the connections. Um, there's a lot of people, 1,500 people came to Canberra. You know, 
that's not bad for an EO kind of, you know, policy kind of type type event with some technology on the site. Yeah. So I, I would definitely build on Australia first. I think what I what I found most useful personally in Australia was some of the hands-on um, exercises where mm. you could come in and there were like six tables and you could go and you could see what Airbus was doing or you could see what Esri was doing or you could see what, you know, um, some smaller Australian company, you know, there, there are many different companies and, and it was like you go around and then you could talk and you could get as techy as you want or you could ask about licensing. You know, there were all sorts of stuff. And then at the end, there was a summary and people would provide feedback on that exercise. I thought that I've not seen that in many places. And that's the kind of thing, I think, where it's open and, and kind of like transparent and everyone's there talking and giving feedback and asking some of the tough questions, I found that really, really useful. And I'd like to do a lot more of that. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I think um, we, we present it as being the opportunity to, uh, you know, where else can you go and meet with so many national representatives which have an interest in geospatial information, uh, observation information. You know, there's there's no other forum that can provide that, and I think that's something which uh, Geo can uh, can leverage and can there's really uh, really offer. That mm -hmm. I just want to throw out there. I mean, we're in this climate emergency, and we have all of mm -hmm. these issues around biodiversity and ecosystem collapse, and even you know greenhouse gases and and the pure climate play. All of that stuff is aided by Earth observations. And I really think that moving, and, and we talk a lot about insights. And I think, like I'm saying, I want to move from data to domains. I'd like to move from insights to evidence. I think this is where the private sector can really help to interpret. Even if you get insights, it doesn't always make sense. So being able to provide that evidence for decision making, I think that's a big thing for GEO. And I think that's where the private sector can really help because they have a bro you know a breadth of experience they're not just doing one job like in one specific area i'm sure there'll be many uh, many on this call now who'll be uh, interested to buy into that and to uh, uh, to see that developed as a as a theme i think that could be uh, that could be a uh, a good idea coming out of, uh, out of out of this discussion um we've run for half an hour this is the point i'd normally uh, see if anyone else wishes to to join in we've got a few questions in in chat um emmanuel uh, mondon was the uh, the first one to put a, a, a question in i'll go to him this time but n not next time emmanuel emmanuel take the floor good afternoon no, uh, <laughs> the first is the last so <laughs> Uh, Jeff, yeah. start with start with uh, someone else. Uh, I, I had several questions, all are uh, in the chat. So, so start 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 with one of your questions. Come on in. Yeah. So uh, I was mentioning uh, Solid from uh, World Wide Web Consortium. Um, I was deeply involved in OGC as well. Uh, I'm pretty convinced by interoperability. So OGC is in is tackling geospatial interoperability, uh, whereas uh, SOLID from W3C is tackling data interoperability. So my question was, are you aware of, of this? Are you already uh, discussing with those guys? And not only for Stephen, but for all the group. Very, very interesting initiative, SOLID from W3C. So uh, I, I'm at Salut. Emmanuel. Uh, uh, I, I'm aware um, and we're trying to get, we're actually speaking to OGC, uh, not on, not about, on, on solid we're doing nothing, but um, we're looking, we're trying to work with OGC to look at interoperability across some of these platforms like AWS, Microsoft, Google Earth Engine, and looking at some of the, the work we're doing there. So this has been led by Gilberto Camara. Um, and we're, we're trying to get that. I mean, this was his keynote last year in Canberra was cross-platform interoperability for Earth observations. So that's that's an ongoing thing. And I think we'll probably put out a paper at some point to get contributions and ideas back in from others. Uh, your other question about the EOSC, 
Um, we went to them and they told us it wouldn't be ready till 2021. So we, we're moving faster. Um, we, we asked them if they could help us with our programme and they said no, it was too soon. This was about five months ago. Yeah, they got only 500 million, maybe that's why. Um, so uh, another topic is, is related to data sovereignty. Uh, I fully agree with you. Um, and from data to, 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 to domains. Uh, GaiaX is a very interesting initiative as well. And, and I think you should discuss with them. Uh, they just held their uh, summit yesterday and today. Um, they are tackling both the interoperability across platforms, across domains, plus the, the data sovereignty. But, but as you know, this is going to take a long time because we've both been in these discussions for 15 years. And there are many, uh, many, I, there are many, many discussions. It's for everyone attending. Uh, you know, uh, uh, we need to take F observation outside of his niche. Uh, we need to take geospatial outside of his niche. And as Jeff was mentioning, more and more startups or big players are leveraging F observation and geospatial. Look at Gaia X. Uh, look at the domains and the data space they are addressing you will see F observation across the board. Who were attending the two-day event? Two guys from geospatial world. Two guys out of 4,600. And it's the same. Okay. I mean, I'm doing this spatial finance course. There's, there's very few geospatial people in that. Yeah. So yeah. we need to reinvent, reinvent ourselves. Huh? We, have, we, have, we have to spread ourselves a bit wider. Um, okay, Thank thanks. You. Thanks, Emmanuel. Um, Jeff, you, you, you're coming in right, right on the uh, the um, the question that Steve was raising about uh, uh, promoting insights and developing insights. Do you want to develop that a bit further? Yeah. No, I was just. Um... It actually fits with the previous question as well, I think, to some degree that, uh, I mean, we know we have these big issues coming up now of, um, of data volumes and, and then uh, dis getting those distributed around to different users, uh, the ac access to that data, communications, uh, and also sovereignty in sharing data or building data into products that we then that then get passed on or commercialized etc um, and I've just been thinking quite a lot recently about this issue which the terms came up about insights rather than um, than trying to distribute huge amounts of data or imagery or uh, information products you know how do we we should be selling insights really solutions to people's pain points rather than um, I mean we all love earth observation and pretty pictures that's why we're in this business um, <laughs> But our, our clients often just want an answer. So, you know, I was just wondering if Steve has seen that from the GEO perspective as well, that, uh, you know, maybe people don't want to see a portal with a big pile of cloudy images down the one side, you know, what they really want is uh, some kind of some kind of traffic light, you know. Yeah, you're right. You're right. I mean, I, I, it, it, I, I, I get invited to all sorts of strange meetings. Um, it, last year or the year before, I was with the Emperor of Japan, you know, and then the Deputy President of Kenya, and 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 you you can't you can't start bringing out like all sorts of EO stuff and start showing it, you know for people at that level, and I think even even if it, they're not the Emperor of Japan, even if it's just a decision maker somewhere, I think trying to show them, like you said, what's the what's the solution to the problem, um, and then if they want to see, I mean, I I. I do like the imagery because what I find hugely valuable is the change over time, especially when you're talking about, you know, like, let's say you've got uh, uh, water resources in Bolivia where you used to have a, a, a lake that was very full and now you can see it's almost empty and that has huge socioeconomic impact and societal impact. And so I, I do like it from that and like urban sprawl and all of these things I find that this is the challenge like, I've been speaking with the people working on the sustainable development goals and they keep saying to me, but we have our statistics, we have all the information. And I'm like, yes, but we can show you how to 
get results much faster and we can supplement and complement your results and your approach. And some people will eventually get it and kind of go, oh, wow, this is this is great. So yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, insights for sure, but I want to take it even further, at least, you know, in terms of like, if you look at what we're doing, you know, the UK is going to host the COP, the climate um, big meeting next year. And I'd really like to do something much more around evidence that goes into the, the whole climate arena. That could be a good hello, challenge. Jeff. Hey. <laughs> so. I was just saying hi. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Thanks, Jeff. Um, okay. Uh, I don't know if, if that was a, a serious question, Stefan. Sorry to you, uh, you were asking. I don't think there was an audio glitch. I'm not sure that Steve did mention the, the name of the company, but uh, you're not you're not turned on yet. Oh, so then I did. Well, there was a clear, there was a little noise label like you know on my computer. So I was just wondering if I didn't hear the name or the name was not mentioned. I, d I don't think Steve mentioned the name. No. Ah, uh, okay. Anyway, good to see you. Good to see you too. <laughs> okay. And to, to see all of you. Obviously. Yeah, well, ha happy that uh, people are leaving their cameras on this time. There's more, many more leaving cameras on, which is, uh, which is, which is nice. Okay. That's so because um, really, that's because they're really listening. <laughs> well, Jeff, Jeff, there is. I mean, I, I actually think Europe is is quite far ahead of part other parts of the world. There, there are not many regional associations. There's not many things like Parsec or Fire or E-Shape. And I, and I do think from a geo perspective that Eurogeo could probably, and I'm hoping one of my colleagues from Eurogeo is on here, I think Eurogeo could do something to, to kind of write this up and explain it because we would love to have similar input from, you know, the Americas, particularly, you know, through Amerigeo and, and Afrigeo and AOGeo. And I think, um, you know, you've got Frontier SI in Australia, but I'm not sure there are that many. I mean, this is where you're going to tell me there's 16, but I'm not sure there are that many regional associations that can do. And, and this is what I like about AirScan Eurogeo, because you come together with the industry and with the funding, you know, and with Copernicus. So you have Horizon Europe, you have your association, and you have uh, Copernicus. And that's a very compelling and complete picture in some ways. You make us sound very organised. I think that's uh, that, that, that's good. There's, I think there's a certain truth to that. I think we're um, we, we've we've been working hard, but I mean each region has its own characteristics, and uh, the US. I mean what we see from the US is dominated. You mentioned earlier Microsoft, Google, uh, Amazon, uh, uh, the the big IT players, and the you know how how they can. For, you know, putting some putting some money on the table is marketing budget. It's uh, trivial. We don't have those players in Europe, so we have to take a different approach. Uh, you mentioned Frontiers SI representing Australia, but uh, it's not regional. I think ERSC is the only regional, um, uh, international even, um, representative uh, body for the for the industry. For a time, we were trying to encourage others elsewhere, and because it would be great for us to have other regional associations to talk to and to, to work with, to deal with. But um, you know, nothing has has really matured in um, in Africa. It's been much more from the academic point of view rather than the industry point of view. Again, several attempts to try to put something together, but the geography makes it very hard there. So um, yeah, I think e each area has its uh, has its difference. We try to capitalize on the uh, on the strengths in Europe, which, of course, the research program is very much a strength, not just in the budget that it brings into research, but also for me, uh, one of the key attributes is that it, it makes people work together. It makes people working uh, across borders and to work in teams uh, to, to build on the strengths and people are forced to, uh, to compromise and to, to, to work in that way, which uh, I think is, the, uh, is one of the keys for success. I think there might be another area we haven't touched on. I, I read through some of the work that had been done in Parsec and I saw there was an in-situ data hub and we had this Canberra declaration, which was like, you know, which came out of Australia, which basically drives private sector engagement. We are supposed to develop a strategy to address the collection and sharing of in-situ data. 
and then kind of welcomes the creation of the regional geos, you know, like renaming from the regional geos to regional geos. Mm -hmm. And so that in situ, we've, we've hired someone full time um, from UN Environment, um, who's quite technical, and he's now doing our in situ work. And that might be, I mean, I would, I would encourage people if they're working in this area to get in touch with him because he's looking at, you know, what's the overall picture? What can we put together? He's doing some work with the World Environment Situation Room from UN Environment to, to put together in situ data. Mm -hmm. So I think his work and then some of the other work like around EO for Health, where we're looking at air quality and some other, um, you know, data inputs, I think that might be another area as well for, for development. I mean that 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 sounds really interesting. I mean I think it's one of the uh, the gaps, one of the uh, the missing pieces is is around it in situ. Uh, we've got Emmanuel and Francesca on the on the call, and uh, I'm sure from from the perspective of eShape, if not from Parsec, there would be some uh, interest to reach out and uh, have a have a discussion around that subject, and maybe uh, bring um, who who's the um, who's the representative in uh, in in the Geo Secretariat. Uh, I cannot say his second name. His first name is Florian. Okay. And I can't say it because I don't know how to say it. It's some <laughs> branch of or something. Well, as long as it's on the uh, on the website, we can get an email. Oh, but yeah, that, get, get it from me. Yeah. yeah, that that would be good to um, you know to bring them into contact again. Uh, Eshape, we have a we have a role to uh, to do that. So we would be uh, be more than happy. Um, we're we're coming to the end of our sort of formal time. Um, has anyone else no, got any uh, questions they want to or points? It doesn't have to be a question. They just join the uh, join the discussion. Will um, one thing I, I was going to ask you was whether uh, from Geo um, you've had a. Um, any impact from what, what what impact you've seen from COVID? What uh, what what's the perspective from uh, from Geneva or close to Geneva on uh, on on COVID from geo perspective? Uh, so I guess there's a couple of a couple of perspectives. One is um, we I mean <laughs> I'm I'm in probably one of the worst places in Europe uh, in Geneva. It's sky high the the, the rates. Um, but we've we've been monitoring EO activities. We have a on our website we have a a COVID page. So we've been collecting EO activities linked to COVID for since March, I think. Um, so there's probably about 50 activities in there if anyone wants to go and browse that. Um, on our EO for Health again, um, they have been running every Tuesday one to two hour sessions and everybody's invited um, and all the presentations are publicly available. I can share some of these links with you. Um, all of the presentations have been done on um, the use of earth observations in the COVID or research or, you know, however it's been used, um, all of that is documented as well. Um, and I think it's been, I think what, what people are starting to look at now is impact models. And trying to figure out, you know, um, has their work be, been um, useful and, and meaningful to to determine the impact of COVID? So yeah, we've we've been we've been doing a lot. I mean, if I step a little bit away from EO for Health and I look at the agriculture side, um, we've been doing work in East Africa on locus um, COVID. Uh, there were some floods late last year, so there's the the, the after effect of that all of that in a kind of a food security environment, a food systems approach. Um, so we've also been looking at COVID, you know, as part of some systems as well, not just from a research perspective. So there's 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 quite a lot of stuff going on. I mean, there's way more going on than I know about, but we've mm -hmm. tried to capture on, you know, the kind of the COVID website, all the, the different dashboards and the different activities that people are, are, are undertaking. Uh, I, I think we're seeing enormous potential. I mean, I think we saw you know, the, the Commission and ESA and ESA working with NASA and uh, JAXA have put together uh, sites showing examples of how uh, you know, data can be used. And there's a lot of very impressive examples. 
Um, what we're missing or what we've not been able to um, identify is where those examples have actually fed through into decision taking. And there seem to be very few real life examples where you know, these impressive measurements taken from uh, sentinels or other um, uh, satellites are, are actually being picked up and used in, in government or agencies and decision makers. We, we think we've got one or two, but there seem to be very few. So for me, what it's, what it's showing is a, is, a, is a very strong potential um, and something that we need to work on to, again, show the evidence of where that can uh, feed through into, um, into, into insights. So I'd say that it's worth joining one of the EO for Health calls and asking that question because, you know, the single, the, the dashboard that's been used the most is from John, Johns Hopkins in mm -hmm. the US. Mm -hmm. And that they're part of the team. They're in the EO for Health team and they come in and give a briefing. So, you know, if they don't have some success stories and some policy and some decision using their dashboard, then you're going to struggle, I think, to get it elsewhere. Okay. We'll, we'll try it. We will, we'll be looking in Europe. I mean, it's, it's connected with GeoValue, where, where we have a, a small workshop, which was going to be held next week, but, which but has this, now been postponed. But this, but this is global. I mean, everyone yeah. coming to this call, it's like 1 p.m. on a Tuesday or 2 p.m. on a So it's, a, it's, it's people from all over. It's not just North America. Okay, good. I'll look, look, look for that then. Um, okay. Um, oh, Alistair's uh, talking about gaming technology, augmenting augmented reality that sounds like a good transition to uh to uh, sort of just a, an informal chat at the end before we before we do that alistair um let me just uh, thank everyone for, for for joining um and note that uh our next eo cafe will be in two weeks time same time same place um we'll be looking at uh, eo services and the sdgs um it's uh there's been some work going on uh, linked to ESA and uh, and elsewhere that will be um, talked about in that uh, in that workshop. So please uh, come along in the EO Cafe. Um, look forward to uh, seeing many of you there again. We now are formally closed the formal part of the cafe, but anyone who wishes to to stay and chat. Um, please just stay on the line, just open up your, your microphone and we'll try and try and make sense of things. And uh, Steve and I will certainly stay around and we'll keep the call going for another 10 minutes or so for anyone who's, uh, who's interested. So thanks again. And thank you very much, Steve, for, the, uh, for, for joining us and for the, uh, for the discussion. Thanks for the opportunity.